This video is slightly different to the others on the channel in that it's uh, quite a long one, but it's also a mini course on charting and technical analysis. I thought I'd put this together because I've talked about a lot of the topics I'm going to cover today in various videos and live streams over the years. And I thought, well, let's put it all together in one um, hopefully easily digestible format. So what makes me qualified to talk about this? Well, I did back in the 1996, I passed the STA exam. Uh, the STA is the Society of Technical Analysts, the official body uh, for charting in TA here in the UK. Uh, my first job in financial markets was as a currency technical analyst, and I've worked in financial markets for the last um, 20 odd years now. And I'm actually now a lecturer on uh, one of the STA's modules uh, for their exam, their professional exam that runs every year. So um, I've been a big advocate and a big user of charting over the years. I do not think it is the secret to trading. I'll talk more about it as we go through uh, the course today. Uh, I think it can give you a good foundation in understanding what's going on in markets, but more of that as we uh, get into it. Before we start, I should mention I do uh, have a free weekly newsletter comes out on a Saturday at the end of the trading week, and it's a catch up, what's been going on in markets, uh, what's the hot market I'll be watching in the week ahead, uh, a trading tip in there designed to make you a better trader, and also an update on my performance. Um, if you go to the website, jonesandmarkets.com, you can sign up directly from it uh, for it from there. You'll also see details of a trading course uh, that I've run for a couple of years, um, unlike a lot of people, I did actually publicly trade uh, an account as part of this course, and I've put the results up on the YouTube channel. You can see it uh, on my website as well. Um, it's it, uh, returned just over, just under 55% in the three month period I was openly trading. You can see all the details there. I do have to say, of course, that past performance is no guarantee of future performance, but if you're new to trading or your trading is struggling, or you want to try and improve your trading and your trading returns, uh, take a look at the website for more details. Right, let's get into it then and um, start this charting and technical analysis course off. I'm going to assume no knowledge at all, so we're going to start right from the basics. The first thing we're going to look at is how do we display price data, the different ways of doing it, and the pros and cons. Let's take a look. So let's start off right at the basics um, with price and how we display price. I've got a chart here of the NASDAQ 100 index. It's a, a daily chart. And what we're looking at here is price simply displayed as a line. So I'd argue this is the simplest way of showing price data. Um, I've got it to pick up on the close. Again, a pretty common way of showing it. So it's a daily closing chart showed as a line for the NASDAQ 100. So the close every day, a line is plotted. And of course, we, we connect up the closes uh, and we have our line charts. If I go back over the last couple of years or so, you know, we can clearly see the downtrend from the NASDAQ from the end of 2021 uh, into late 2022. So it's a way of looking at, at perhaps bigger trends. But lots of people, most people, I think when it comes to technical analysis and charting markets, look at price action in a different way. They might look at bars and candlesticks. So let's take a look at what they mean and how they're constructed, and then we'll have a look at it on some real markets. So for many years, the bar chart was a popular way of looking at markets. So with a line chart, we just have one piece of price data, typically the close. So if we're looking at a daily line chart, it'll show us closing prices, plotted um, over a series of time. But lots of people want more information than that. So for many years, like I say, the bar chart was really popular. So with the bar chart, we have three extra bits of information, not just the close. So the range for the bar, that's the range for the market for the day. So it traded from a low to the high up there. So that shows us the range the market traveled through for the day. The tick or the horizontal bar to the left, that's the open. So where the market started trading on that particular day. Of course, if it's a 24 hour market, then it's just after midnight in that time zone. If it's a market that has a fixed opening time, um, 
I, let's say um, a stock trading on the New York Stock Exchange, it will be um, where it opened as the market, as the New York Stock Exchange opened on that particular day. So that's the, the open and up here, the tick or the horizontal bar to the right, that's the closing price uh, for the day. So the last price traded on the day. So we have open, high, low, close. So we get a much better picture as to what actually happened during the day when we're looking at a bar chart. Of course, if we were looking at hourly bar charts, and we'll have a look on some real examples in a second, um, it changes every hour. So we see the high, low, open, close for every hour. So depending on the time frame, that's what the bar is going to show. So on this, this example here, the market opened down here, uh, traded a bit lower, traded a bit higher, but closed here. So this, if we treat this as a daily bar, that was an up day. The market closed higher than it opened. If we go over here to this bar, same information, high, low, open, close, but the market opened here, traded a bit higher, traded lower, and closed down here. So we saw it close lower than the open. So on that day, that was uh, a down day. And we can see that straight away just by looking at the range for the day and the position uh, for these horizontal lines that show the open and the close. So that's, that's a bar chart. Let's take a look at it uh, in the real world. So for now, I'm sticking with the NASDAQ 100 as the example. I've got the bars on. We're sticking with the daily daily bars. Um, so each bar shows the open, high, low, close for the day. I've made them extra thick, uh, so it's a bit, a bit clearer, perhaps, what's been going on. But if we take this bar here on the 1st of February, we can see the tick or the horizontal bar to the left. That's where the market opened on the day, traded lower, down to about 12,000 in this example, traded higher, up to about 12,500, and closed near the highs of the day. Okay, so we know that straight away from just looking at the bar. Now, uh, on this charting platform, it colors it, whether it's a, an up day or a down day, so it makes it a bit easier to spot. So if we have a look at this bar here, Friday the 3rd of Feb, the market opens here around 12,600, trades higher at some point, up to 12,840, but then trades lower, down to 12,500, and closes here. So closes lower than the market opened. So this is considered a down day. The close is lower than the open. In this example, it gets colored in red. So it's very easy with our bar charts uh, to see the direction of the market for the day, the extremes, and of course, the open and the close. So that's looking at price information in a different way. Then, of course, in the last few decades, there's probably an even more popular way of looking at price data, and that's the candlestick chart. Let's take a look at that. So here we have a couple of candlesticks. Now, going back to what I said about bar charts, we have the same data for candles. We have the open, the high, the low, the close. It just gets represented in a slightly different way. So the extremes for the candles, sometimes referred to as wicks, I think from a textbook point of view, referred to as the shadows for the candle. So the high is here at the top of the extreme. The low is down here at the bottom of the extreme. On this candle, because it's colored in white, it's telling us that this is an up day. So if it's an up day, I know the open is down here and the close is up here. So if you think of it, think about candlesticks as a bar chart, but as the difference between the open and the close filled in. I think it's probably the easiest way, and that's referred to as the, the body, the real body of the candle. This candle over here, covered in colored in black, uh, this shows me it was a down day. So again, we have the high and the low. And if it's a down day, then the close is down here and the open was up there. And once again, the difference between the open and the close gets blocked in. As usual, let's take a look at this in a real market uh, to see what it looks like in the real world. So we're back on the NASDAQ chart. Um, I flipped it over to a candlestick chart. So if we pick up on this candle down here, so I've got mine set to green for up days where the market closed higher than the open, red for down days where the market closes lower than where it opened. So on this day here, 31st of Jan, again, I can see I've got the extremes, got the shadows or the wicks. So the high is the top of the wick here and the low down here is the low traded for the day. 
Because it's colored in green, the close was higher than the open, so I know the open was down here, and the close was up here. Again, the same for the next candle, green, the close was higher than the open, it was an up day, so the open was down here, and the close was up there. If we pick up on a red candle, where the market had a down day, which was here, so the market opened here and closed down there. So again, don't forget, it's like a bar chart, but we're filling in the difference between the close and the open to get the body and the color for the candle. Occasionally, we'll have a day where there's perhaps quite a lot of range, but the close is pretty similar to the open. Here's an example. Here's a candlestick here uh, from the 17th of November. The market opens here, trades higher, trades lower, but ends up closing pretty much where it opens on the day. So we have a very small body for the candle. The, the market has been reasonably volatile on the day, but has ended up finishing where it started the day. So the difference between the open and the close is much smaller. Uh, so we have a smaller body on the candle, same sort of one on this candlestick just a few days earlier. So in candlestick charting, often referred to as dojis, these days where the open and the close is very close together. So far, I've been focusing on daily candles, daily bars. I flip this now to an hourly candle. So what we can see here, every hour it draws a new candle. So if we take a look uh, on this day here, this is the 16th of February, uh, 2023. In this hour, we can see that the market started around 12,650. It traded briefly a bit higher, traded down to about 12,500, but closed at 12,525. So a lot of range in that hour, um, I think due to a news release that came out on that day. Then once the hour is up, we start plotting a new candle. So even though we've been looking at daily candles, daily bars so far, of course, you can represent the price data however you want to see it. We can change this again. So still with the NASDAQ 100, and now I've flipped it over to five minute candles. So um, every five minutes, there's a new candle. So every five minutes, we have a different high, low, open close and a different candle gets drawn. So in this five minute period here, which was uh, between 7.20 and 7.25 p.m. UK time, the market opened around 12,287 and closed around 12,320. So closed 30 odd points higher. It was an up candle, so it gets colored in green. The next five minute period from 7.25 to 7.30 uh, was a down candle. Okay, you can see how that price data gets represented over different time frames. Right, that's it. We've, we've had a look at some of the different ways of producing price data. Let's talk about something else. So the different ways of displaying price data there, um, I think candlesticks have probably been the most popular option for 20 years or more now. Um, the next thing we're gonna look at, if you've watched any of the live streams I've done or any other videos I do looking at markets, you'll know uh, that a big part of my mantra is the trend is your friend, um, markets trend. So how can we identify these trends? How can we ride them? And how can we spot when trends could be about to reverse. That's the subject of the next section. Let's get into it. For me, it's just a fact, markets trends. Here we've got um, a daily chart, stick with the NASDAQ for now. So daily candlesticks on the NASDAQ uh, from the lows here, September 2020, up to the highs, November 2021. We have a clear example of an uptrend. If we change this chart, from the highs late 2021, early 2022, to the lows at the beginning of 2023, we have a downtrend. The market is sort of zigzagging its way lower. And of course, at certain times as well, we don't have an uptrend or a downtrend, but we have a sideways trend, something like this. This is from October 22 uh, to the end of 2022, where we don't really have any overall direction. We have the market just trading in a range. So let's take a look at some of the textbook definitions and how we can use trends when we're trading. Let's walk through the, the classic representation of an uptrend, first of all. So the market has moved higher, sells off a bit, and then the next move in the market, let's take a look at this, the market moves higher again. So we've got a higher low than the previous low, and we've now got a higher high than the previous high. So we have the market 
starting into an uptrend. And we'll, we'll talk about the psychology behind this in a second. The market sells off because, of course, no market moves in a straight line. But once again, we get a higher low and the market turns around, pushes higher, and away we go again, off to a higher high than the previous high. So what we're seeing here is a market where perhaps the, the, the more bullish, the more positive investors and traders have the upper hand. Um, traders, investors, whoever, are stepping in a little bit earlier each time to buy the dip. So we have the market selling off to a level, turns around before the previous low. So back here, the market was viewed as cheap, but the sellers, the buyers, sorry, are stepping in a little bit earlier next time around and not waiting to see if it goes back to those old lows. So we have real positive bullish momentum in this market, pushing the market higher, pushes out to a new high compared to the previous high. And then again, when we get a sell off again, the market perhaps stops before it gets to the previous low, turns around and our trend carries on. So this is traditionally how you know we'd look at a textbook view of an uptrend, a procession of higher highs and higher lows. And when it comes to trying to analyze trends and looking for areas to buy in, one of the most popular ways of identifying a trend and thinking about, well, where am I gonna get involved in this trend is by using a trend line. And in an uptrend, traditionally, the trend line would sit underneath the lows. So the assumption is if the market sells off again from the most recent high, we're looking to see it hold above this trend line. So from a textbook point of view, a couple of points can give us a hint. There's a trend line going on here. And the third test, that's the confirmation of the trend line. And after that, the assumption is, well, if you see this market sell off, we want to see it hold above the trend line. So whilst it's above that particular trend line, then the trend is intact. And of course, the flip side of that is some people would take the view if the market breaks, sells off and breaks below that trend line, it's a suggestion that things are changing. And you see this over all sorts of time frames, um, daily charts, hourly charts, shorter term charts, like 10 minute, five minute charts, because markets do trend. I have to say, I'm not a fan of just trading purely off trend line breaks. If it was that easy, then um, all the technical analysts would always have winning trades. It doesn't work that way in the real world all the time, or perhaps even 70% of the time, but it can be one of the things that gives you a hint that perhaps the trend is changing. But I am a big fan of trading with the trend because I'm putting market momentum on my sides. If we flip this over, let's just take a look at a downtrend for the sake of completeness. So a downtrend is really just a mirror image of an uptrend. We have a market that has moved lower, rallies, but can't take out the previous high, slips lower again, and breaks below the previous low. And again, because no market moves in a straight line, we might have a rally, but a rally that fails to get near the previous high. The market sells off again, and we see a new low for the move, another rally, and the market again can't get near the previous high, sells off, we have a new low, and uh, and so it goes on. So once again, when it comes to drawing trend lines, this time around, because it's a downtrend, we're going to put our trend line on top of the highs. So the assumption is when the market rallies back to that trend line, we're expecting it to run out of steam. So once again, we're expecting it to fail. But if the market should break through the trend line, like so, then it can be one of the first signs that perhaps this trend is starting to change. So there we go. That's how it works from a textbook theoretical point of view. Let's take a look in the real world. So here's a nice example. This is the S&P 500 this time around. Flipped it around, still on US markets. Um, but I thought let's take a look at a different one. So here's a, a nice example of um, the S&P. So I've picked up on a lows from March 2021. And we can see the markets moving higher, sells off. We can draw our trend line in. And the assumption is every time the market moves back to that trend line, we're looking for the trend line to hold. Okay, but a, a really good trend there, you know, almost a 
almost a textbook one in the S&P 500. Higher highs, higher lows. When the market sells off, it doesn't threaten the previous major low and then carries on moving out to fresh highs. So there's our example of an uptrend. And if we were seeing the market sell off, like in this example here, August 2021, back to the trend line, our assumption is that the trend line is going to hold and we're going to see this market bounce back and move higher, which it did in this instance. So there's our uptrend. So I'm still on the S&P 500, still on a daily chart. I've jumped forward in time. So we're now looking at 2022, the highs, actually the all-time high at the time of recording uh, for the S&P 500. Uh, so the market sold off, rallied, failed to take out anywhere near that previous high, sells off again. So we've absolutely got a downtrend going on. We could have drawn our bigger picture downtrend there. So we've got the second touch there. We're waiting to see what happens next. The market sells off to a fresh low in June of 2022, rallies back up. And here we are once again, right by that downtrend line. So the assumption is for now, the downtrend line is going to hold and we're going to see the market sell off. Let's see what happens next. What happens next is the trend continues. So we had that old um, trend line that had been in place for about six months. The market rallied up to it at 4,300, turns around and moves to fresh lows uh, for the year so far for that down move. So once again, the trend line did its job of holding the trend, um, holding the market. And it would have been you know, a, a good entry point. You know, again, like I say, I'm a, I'm a big fan of making sure I'm trading with the trend. I want to put momentum on my side. So whilst trend lines don't really form a part of my own trading approach uh, in deciding where to buy or sell, most of the charts I look at, I will put a trend line on them just to remind me what direction the trend is and the importance of trading with it. And just to complete this view of the S&P, what's interesting now, what's happened in the last month or so at the time of recording, this trend line that's been in place for a year now, uh, we're seeing the S&P um, finally starting to push through it. So are we seeing, again, at the time recording, the first couple of months of 2023, a break in that 12-month downtrend for the S&P? Uh, so I think there are some other things we can look at to try and figure out if this is a valid break. But again, if you're using just a simple approach like trend lines, you know, it's very easy to get alerted when perhaps sentiment is changing. And we could draw even a new trend line now. Off those lows in October 2022, we've seen this trend um, start to build. So is this perhaps um, the new recovery trend in the S&P following the break? Um, I don't know yet. I think it looks like it is It is going that way. But of course, we'll have a better idea as time goes on. But there's, there's a really simple way of using trend lines to identify trends, try and trade with the trend, and also spot when perhaps there's a big shift happening when it comes to market sentiment. I could probably do a few hours of videos on trends, but just to perhaps wrap things up, I thought let's, look, let's take a look at a different market. This is Euro US dollar. So this was uh, a trend I picked up on the highs from February 2022. An absolutely great downtrend in Euro US dollar. Uh, comes back to it in May, June 2022, that was the third touch for me. Market sells off. We have various attempts on the way down into the end of 2022 to uh, test this trend line. Uh, so good short sells into the trend line. Again, to jump forward. The trend line starts to break. And this is late October 2022 to bring it right up to the present day. This is where we are at the time of recording. Uh, on Euro US dollar. So we saw perhaps the start of a break in October 2022. Fast forward to February 2023, and the market has moved about 700 points higher uh, following that break. So, again, you know, another good reason for me why I always put trend lines on the chart because I think they're really interesting and it's really obvious to spot when there is perhaps a shift in sentiment happening. If we pick up on this new trend in Euro US dollar, then for me in 2023, this is the interesting trend to watch. It has absolutely accelerated away from that. It's come off a bit in the last couple of weeks, but you can see right at the start, we had three touches on the trend line at the end of 2022 before the market really took off. So there's a, an introduction to, to uptrends, downtrends, sideways trends, 
and how we can use something as simple as a trend line just to try and highlight potential trading or investment opportunities. So sticking with the topic of price action, we're going to continue um, with that in the next section. I think it's an area that is often ignored by people because it seems a bit too simplistic, but I think it's really incredibly powerful. It's looking at the importance of highs and lows, support, resistance, breakouts, patterns, all of that sort of stuff. So um, as usual, let's get in to the next session on support and resistance. So let's take a look at the idea of support and resistance in a bit more detail. Um, here's an example from gold. This is a daily chart on gold. This is the idea of support. So the market hits a level in late September 2022, rallies, comes back to it, and that level holds again. Uh, and just in case you weren't sure, rallies, comes back to it, and holds again in November before eventually starting to move a lot higher. So that's um, one example of support. Let's take a look at resistance. We'll take a look at a currency market this time. This is pound against the dollar. Again, we're sticking with daily charts for now for simplicity. So pound rallies up mid-December 2022 towards 124.50. The high is up here. Sells off, quite a big sell off. It sold off about 600 points over the next three weeks or so. The market turns around again and rallies back up to 124.50 once more. That old level where the sellers came in last time round, it can't get through it once more this time round. And the market turns around and once again, we see the sell off. And a great example of a market just ranging between support and resistance. This was um, this is oil from December 2022 to February 2023. So on the upside, it really can't get much traction through $83, 8370. And every time we rally up to there, we see the market run out of steam. But on the downside, when oil drifted back to the low $70 a barrel, we saw the buyers come back in. So a market there, good example of a sideways trend as well, just tying that back into that, but also trapped between support and resistance levels. So let's take a look at the theory of support and resistance and how we might use this when it comes to trading or investing. So to walk through the textbook explanation of support, first of all, the market sells off and then gets to a point, hits a level where it turns around and we see a rally. So we have, that's, that's the first sign of support. So the market's hit a level. We've clearly had support left there because the market has recovered. So the assumption is, if we see the market sell off again, is this level going to hold? We saw sentiment change last time round. The buyers come back in and push the market back up. So one trading idea, if the market sells off once more, back to that level and starts to turn around, then that can be considered a buying opportunity. A level that was important in the past has held once again, so the market sees value down there. So Again, people will typically highlight these using a horizontal line. So that's where we have our support level in that particular market. So one idea of using support such as this um, is an idea as to where to place our stop losses. If we're buying a market because we think it's going to go up uh, and we think this is an important support level, then if we're buying because of that reason, then clearly if that level gets taken out by a certain amount, whatever we decide that is going to be, uh, then our reason for being in the trade has perhaps gone. But support levels don't stay intact all of the time. So, for example, if the market turns down and then breaks through the support, it can suggest that perhaps we're at the start of another leg down in the trend that we're following. This is the, they're often referred to as a breakout uh, by chartists. Uh, the assumption is the support has failed, the level that in the past was holding the market up, is no longer doing it. The market participants don't see value any there anymore. Maybe we want to think about going short. Occasionally, we'll get a, a bit of a retest according to the textbooks. That can be our opportunity to go short before the market falls away again. But so breaks through support levels like this can also be opportunities. Let's flip things on its head and have a look at resistance. So not surprisingly, resistance is the, the flip side. Of support. The market trades up to a level 
everything looks positive, and then sentiment shifts and the market starts to sell off. So that that high that we've left behind on whatever time scale we're looking at, whether it's a daily, weekly, hourly, five minute chart, is referred to as a resistance level. So once again, the chartist might draw a horizontal line on there and think, well, this is an important high that's been left in the market. This is resistance. And if we saw the market trade up to that level, once again, and start to turn lower, that can be our opportunity to sell short. The market just cannot get through that level of resistance. So what markets do near levels of support or resistance can give us trading opportunities. And of course, these levels don't stay intact forever. So if we saw a market do this, that's the breakout. So a breakout through resistance can be a suggestion that a new leg of the uptrend is underway. So these as well, you know, can be opportunities to place the trade. And sometimes, you know, we don't get we don't get breakouts that suddenly break through resistance and never look back. And there's often an element of choppiness. You know, we can see the market come back before it actually makes its mind up as to whether or not this is going to be a valid breakout and perhaps move higher still. But as usual, let's take a look at this on some real markets where support and resistance holds and where support and resistance breaks. So I've gone back to the daily chart of the Nasdaq and the highs in November 2021. So the market had pushed up near 16,800, then sells off, sold off um, about 1,200 points. So we saw a reasonable sell off. So this may have left some thinking, well, perhaps these old highs are going to be important resistance. So they might decide to draw a line on these highs to highlight them as potential resistance. Let's do that. So we have our resistance line drawn in at 16,770. Let's walk forward and see what happens next. So over the course of the next few days, the market does push up near 16,583 is as high as it gets so far. So it's come within less than a couple of hundred points of that old resistance. And then we have a day where it does push a little bit higher once more. But then we have a day where it turns down. Now, those who are thinking that perhaps this is going to be a real barrier for the Nasdaq up here could use that as an opportunity to think about selling short because with it looks like this market could be failing near the old resistance. And if we're looking to sell short because of that reason, then one idea for a stop loss is obviously to have it above that resistance level. If the market breaks through the level, then the trade looks to be wrong. Let's walk forward a bit further in time. Now, this was an extreme move. And as it happened, it, this did end up being the all time high uh, for the Nasdaq. But you can see so far, at least. But you can see how it all starts with the market failing near resistance. And it pushed back. It got as high on that day there towards the end of December. 2021 got as high as 16,670. So it came within 100 points of the old high. But a, a great example there of a market failing at resistance. Let's find an example of support. So I'm going to stick with the NASDAQ for the purposes of this example. And we've jumped forward to October 2022. The market had been selling off. Here's the low in October 22, uh, down around 10,430. The market had bounced a couple of hundred points. It's coming back to it again. Is the support going to hold? Let's put a support line on this old low. So our support line's in at 10,431. The market on this day here, which was going to be the 3rd of November 22, is about 260 points above that line. Let's jump forwards in time, take it step by step, see what happens next. So we're, we're wondering if this old support is going to hold. So we have a day where the market does push a little bit lower, but you can see as it's a green candle actually recovers as the day goes on. So the close ends up being higher than where it opens. So some might say, well, actually, is this market starting to turn around? So if we are thinking about being a buyer based off this old support, one idea is to be a buyer with stops the other side of the low, 10,431 in this example. Let's walk it forward. More positive day again the next day. And if we push forward in time, we can see eventually we get this massive move higher. But the old support, the point here is the old support has held. Let's jump forwards a bit further in time. So this move in November 2022, 
was the first test of that support. And if I jump forwards to the end of December 2022, here we are again. So the old support sits at 10,431. The market has closed at 10,690. So once again, we're 260 points above the old support. The question is, is the old support going to hold this time around? Let's take it forwards. So we have a day where the market does rally strongly ahead of that support. So once again, someone may view that as the old support holding and perhaps an opportunity to buy in. Let's walk forwards once more. So the market does chop around for about a week, still holding around that old support, but really a lack of direction. Um, but so far, the old support has not been breached. But as time goes on, we do see this market, the Nasdaq, once again, move away from the old support. So a really good example there, you know, a couple of opportunities where that previous big support was tested, it held, and it did eventually result in a rally for the Nasdaq 100 uh, on two occasions away from that support level. And to bring things up to date at the time of recording, this is where we are now. So the old support uh, has continued to hold. It has been a major low for the NASDAQ uh, so far, and it had eventually traded about 2,400 points higher than that. If the market did come under some serious pressure from where it is now, it's currently almost 2,000 points above that support. But if it came under some serious pressure, it would be interesting to see if the old support held. So there's some examples of support and resistance holding and offering up uh, potential opportunities. Let's take a look at some examples of it breaking. So to mix things up a little bit, we're now looking at an hourly chart. So it's an hourly chart for gold, um, each candlestick representing an hour's worth of trading. We had a low for gold at the end of January 2023. Um, we can see it on this hourly candle down here, the price of gold traded down as low as $1,900 an ounce. And we can see the market moved away. The market rallied um, about $60 away from that level so far. Uh, so this has been left as important support. Let's uh, pick up on that and put our horizontal support line on. So, so far we've seen the market sell off, but the old support has held. Let's walk forwards. But then things change. See a big sell off in gold, this big hourly candle that goes from about $1,916 an ounce down below $1,884 an ounce in that, in that one hour period. So the big support, the big short term support, I should say, because it's an hourly chart that we're looking at, has broken. So it can be a suggestion that perhaps sentiment is changing. If I'd been a buyer of gold, I would probably have been stopped out of the trade. But does this suggest that we're going to see the price of gold move lower still? Let's walk forwards in time. It actually does. This sell-off um, continues. And you can see here over the next four hours, the price of gold moves even lower still. So a great example there of a breakout or a breakdown to the downside, suggesting we're going to see more weakness. And that's what we've had. The market then went broadly sideways for a few days, but then again, about a week later, started breaking lower still. And it all started, let's not forget, with the break of this support. So it can be the first suggestion that sentiment is changing and perhaps we're going to see a negative move for the market. Let's take a look at a breakout through resistance. So I thought we'd look at a different market again. This time it's uh, crude oil, uh, West Texas crude. And I've gone back to... November 2021, uh, October 21, looking at the highs back then, oil almost got as high as $86 a barrel and sells off, big sell off, down to 64 and below 64 into December 2021, but rallies back up. Uh, and here we are in Jan 22, uh, not far away from that old resistance level. Let's pick up on it by drawing our line. So we had this level in the past that was a big problem for oil, just ahead of $86 a barrel. And we saw the oil price sell off more than $20 from this barrel. What's going to happen this time around? My assumption would be looking at this, I'm expecting it to run out of steam. I'm expecting $86 to be a barrier for oil. Let's walk forward a little bit. So we have a period over about a week and a half where, first of all, the level is broken, but the market chops around. And this, I think, is it's a really important lesson to take on board. Just because a level breaks and the textbooks say, oh, this is a breakout, doesn't mean the market is going to take off straight away. It can often lead 
need a little bit of patience to see what develops. So over the course of a week, we saw the market chop around and then start to move higher again. So when the market, for me, the second time it moves through that level, this gives more validity to the breakout. So the price has traded up to 87.68, 67 in this example. Um, and for me, it looks like a breakout. So the expectation is perhaps the price of oil is starting its next move higher. Let's jump forwards in time. Over the course of the next few weeks, next couple of months, we do see the price of oil continue to move higher. I mean, clearly this was accelerated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but even ahead of that, following the break of oil, of that level by oil, we did see the market continue to move higher. So, so a good example here of how a breakout can suggest a new trend is forming, but also not to assume just because a level has been broken that the market is going to start moving in that direction straight away. You know, I think I think one of the hardest traits to learn as a trader and an investor is patience. Just because we've decided the market is going in one direction doesn't necessarily move. It's going to start doing that immediately. And also we need to accept the fact we could be wrong. So that's why managing risk using stop losses continues to be absolutely critical when trading. Before we leave the topic of support and resistance and trends, let's have a quick look at chart patterns. I must admit, I don't use these myself. I think you've either got an eye for it or you don't. But let's talk about um, a couple of popular patterns that you may well have heard of. So first of all, the double top. Uh, So-called because a market trades up to a resistance level then sells off, then trades back up or near it uh, and sells off again. So, so we know that we have resistance left from what we've covered so far. We've got a resistance level that's been left up there, um, but it's a double top if the market falls below the support line, the low in between the top. So if we get a move through there, then that's the completion of the double top. And what um, chartists would do with this, they're expecting the market to continue to sell off and the target would normally be the distance or the height of the double top. So if this was, for example, 200 points in, in height, let's say it was, a, it was an index, if that was 200 points, then when the market breaks below that support level, completing the double top, then the target would be for that move to be repeated down here. Like I say, I'm not really a fan of it. Um, I don't use them myself, um, but perhaps it's something that will work for your own trading and investing. Not surprisingly, the flip side of the double top is the double bottom. So the market trades to a level, bounces, then slips back again, doesn't take out the low, bounces again. Once again, like uh, the mirror image, of the double top, we have potential re resistance there. So the double bottom is said to have been completed if the market breaks out through that, completes the double bottom. So once again, those who are looking at these sort of patterns would say, okay, well, if this distance here was 150 points, then following the point of the breakout, we're looking for 150 point move again. And I suppose the psychology makes sense. If the market's trading in a range of 150 points, breaks out and is going to start trading in a new range, um, then we could totally see it repeating the same uh, move again. Uh, the problem I have with this approach is managing the risk, uh, setting sensible stop losses and all of that. But if you hear about double tops, double bottoms, these are what these patterns are. The variation on these, there's a triple top and a triple bottom just an extra peak or an extra trough uh, to, to set up those patterns. And again, it's the break of that level that gives us the opportunity or gives us the signal that perhaps the market is reversing. Another slight variation is the head and shoulders pattern, which you may have heard of. So the market is trending higher and everything, uh, for example, seems to be okay. So we have higher highs, higher lows. Uh, so, so far at least, this is just a normal uptrend. And what we have to watch for here is something that's known as the neckline. And I can draw that in between the shoulders, take it off this point here, through that there, and it's the break 
of the neckline that shows the pattern has completed. So if the neckline were to break, the expectation is for the market to fall at least the height of the head from the neckline. So again, if that was 100 points and the market breaks through here, we're expecting to the market fall um, 100 points lower from there. I must admit, I do have a problem spotting these patterns. I think you've either got an eye for patterns or you haven't, but those are some of the popular chart patterns. One of my favorite candlestick patterns is actually one of the most simple, and it's the engulfing pattern. So we have a market that's trending higher, and um, let's say this is the latest candle in that trend. So it's a positive candle, the close is higher than the open, but then the next day, let's stick with daily candles for now, this happens. We have a candle that engulfs the previous day's candle and goes in the opposite direction. So we'd had a market that had been trending higher. Let's assume it'd be moving higher for a week. Uh, we have a positive candle here, and then suddenly we have a candle that goes the other way. And you can see the real body of the candle engulfs the previous day's candle. So it can be a suggestion that sentiment is changing. So this setup, is known as bearish engulfing. If it happened the other way around, where we had a downtrend and then suddenly had a positive candle engulfing the previous bearish candle, then that's known as bullish engulfing. And I think it's, it's just a very simple way of looking at a shift in sentiment throughout the day that, that's big enough to um, cover the main trading range of the previous day in the opposite direction. Let's take a look at some examples. So here's the dollar index chart, and I've gone back to uh, January 2022. We'll have a look at a more up-to-date example in a second. But we had a week of pretty much falling prices for the dollar index, the DXY. Uh, on this day here, the market moved a bit lower, but you can see the next day, we have a turnaround in sentiment. So we have a green day, a positive day where the close is higher than the open and the body of the candle on this day here, the Friday, engulfs the body of the candle of the previous day. So this is known as bullish engulfing. So it's a suggestion that perhaps the trend is starting to change or at least slow down. Let's walk forward and see what happens next because one idea of trading these reversal patterns like a bullish engulfing would be to be a buyer when the pattern is confirmed in this example at the end of the day. Uh, and for me, I've got an obvious place to put the stop loss, probably the other side of the lows of that day, because if the market is gonna reverse, it really shouldn't revisit the lows. Anyway, let's walk through and see what happens next. You can see it did end up being uh, an important low. Over the course of the next week and a half, we did see this market, the dollar index in this case, rally after that bullish engulfing pattern. And once the pattern had happened, it never even really looked back to the low set on the pattern day. Let's jump forwards and have a look at bearish engulfing. So here's an example from uh, September 2022. So the market had been moving higher, dollar index again. We're on daily charts. Then we get a day where the market does actually push higher, sets a new high for this up move, but then engulfs the previous day's candle. It was a very small bodied candle anyway, something of a doji, um, but again, a, a shift in sentiment on the day. It did actually cover the previous day's candle, the one before yesterday's candle as well. Let's see what happened next. It did end up actually being uh, something of a major resistance level. Uh, we did see the market sell off for a week, then actually we had a bit of a bearish, bullish engulfing down here and the market bounced back and then sell off again a bit further um, after that. So they can be a good indication of a shift in sentiment. Obviously, it is important to bear in mind nothing works all the time. Here's an example. Uh, bullish engulfing here on this day, 19th of October 2022. Okay, the market did sort of try to push up for a couple of days, but eventually fell away. So as ever, with all of this stuff, um, don't think anything works all the time or even 70% of the time. You know, it's important, really important to manage risk uh, when we're trading uh, and investing as well. But I like the idea of bullish and bearish engulfing pan, uh, patterns with candles because I think it makes it very easy to spot and easier to figure out 
how to manage your risk on the trade. Now, the final topic for today, I think this is one of the causes of people getting frustrated and lost when they start trading, and it's the topic of indicators. There are so many indicators out there now available in trading platforms, on, on charting software, um, and I think when we first start trading, we think if only I can crack the right indicator, um, the secret to the markets are mine. That's not the case, but I thought I can't do a course without including indicators on it. Let's jump in and have a look at three indicators that are calculated in different ways, used in different ways. Perhaps one of them will be useful for your own trading. Let's take a look. Right, indicators. It is always um, a bit of a job to know where to start with these, and I'll show you why. If we just look on this charting platform and I bring up the indicators, you can see there are just so many of them. So it's not surprising, I think, that a lot of people um, end up going down something of a rabbit hole when it comes to indicators when they first start trading, believing that surely the secret to the markets is in there somewhere. But as I said, I'm going to look at three indicators uh, in this. Let's, let's kick things off with the RSI the relative strength index. Let's um, bring that up. So, so here we are, here's the RSI. This has been around since 1978. So it is definitely one of, the, one of the older indicators. I think one of perhaps the issues amongst trading over the last 15 years or so, 15, 20 years, as computerized charting has become more widespread and you know, just uh, the default method for lots of people when it comes to trading, we've seen quite the growth in indicators because it's just programming something into a charting package. So I think that's one of the issues, one of the challenges perhaps of people trading now is wading through all these different indicators, but if they want to. But the RSI has been around for, um, what is it, 40 odd years now, more than 40 years. And it's, it's quite a simple indicator, I think. Again, if you want to look at the formula for the RSI, you, you can Google it. Obviously, it's it's out there, but it, it looks at um, a period of time in the market. I'm looking at the last 10 days on this RSI. We're on a daily chart. Um, it always gives me a reading between zero and 100%. It's, I suppose, you consider it a momentum-based indicator. It's looking at where is the market now compared to where and how it's been trading over the last 10 days in the example of my 10-day RSI. A reading above 70%, the market is said to be overbought. A reading below 30%, the market is said to be oversold. I think those readings on their own can be dangerous, you know, because again, we have to be cautious in a strong trending market. Um, indicators such as the RSI can move to an extreme very quickly. Here's an example from the NASDAQ. Here's the NASDAQ back in... Um, the summer of 2022, the RSI went overbought. You can see it here. It's gone above the 70% band into the upper band. But um, the NASDAQ doesn't really care that its RSI is overbought and the market uh, just carried on higher. Of course, you see it on the flip side as well. If we jump forward in time a bit to September 2022, the RSI goes oversold, but the NASDAQ doesn't actually care that the RSI is oversold and the NASDAQ ended up dropping ultimately another thousand points from that level. So as ever, there is no magic system that works all the time, it needs to be used with a little bit of caution, but it can help you sort of take the temperature of the market. Sticking with the NASDAQ, I mean, it's a good example here of it working well. So late December 22, uh, the 10 day RSI dips into oversold briefly. Uh, the NASDAQ sells off. This also coincided with uh, pretty big support on the NASDAQ. This is the support example we looked at in um, one of the previous videos, uh, or one of the previous lessons as part of this video. And then if we go into Jan of 23, again, peaks too early, the RSI, but eventually the market does start to roll over on the second move of the RSI into the overbought. So like I say, it can help you take the temperature of the market, give us overbought, oversold readings. I've been looking at it on a daily chart. If we flip it over to an hourly chart, for example, we'll still have 
overbought, oversold readings. It can be a bit more erratic um, due to the uh, the volatile nature of the data it's collecting on a 10. Looking uh, on an hourly chart, a 10 period RSI is looking at the last 10 hours. So if we have an hour that has a particularly big move, like if we look here, February 2023, we had... Uh, the Nasdaq swinging around for three hours, not really going anywhere, but swinging around in some big ranges, it can cause some erratic moves on the RSI. But we can use it, you know, for those sort of time frames as well. Me, I still prefer to use it on the dailies. And the sort of thing that I look for, I, I've mentioned this on some of the live streams uh, that I do, is the idea of divergence. So what is divergence? It doesn't happen that often, but we do have some good examples here. So there's bearish and bullish divergence. So bearish divergence is like here in August of 2022. So the NASDAQ is rallying higher, sells off a little. Uh, the RSI has gone overbought. So we've seen the RSI as at an extreme. When the market sells off, the RSI dips back out of overbought. The market rallies, pushes higher. The RSI pushes back into overbought, but it doesn't take out the previous high. So the market uh, has pushed higher, but we're not seeing that sort of trend in the RSI. So this is known as bearish divergence, where the market hits a level, uh, pushes higher, but the RSI doesn't follow through. It can be a warning that perhaps the trend is running out of steam. And it was the case in this example. So there's bearish divergence, warning of a top. We only have to jump forward a couple of months here and we have bullish divergence. So what we have here, the market in early October was pushing lower. The RSI had gone into oversold. The market rallied, dragging the RSI out of oversold. But in the market, the NASDAQ in this example turns lower again, um, but we have a higher low on the RSI. So even though the market is making new lows for the down move, the RSI has made a higher low. So this is known as bullish divergence, a suggestion that perhaps the market momentum to the downside in this example is running out of steam. And that did prove to be the case. That was that big low that we saw for the NASDAQ uh, in October 2022. If we fast forward to where we are now, I don't think we have anything going on really. So at the time of recording this, mid-February, uh, the RSI has been overbought. On the NASDAQ, uh, we haven't really had any divergence. The market has sold off a little, and the RSI at the moment is sitting around 50%, so halfway through the range. But hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavor for how to use or different ways of using an indicator like the RSI. Like I say, I prefer looking for divergences. They don't happen that often. So when they do happen, I think they're worth paying attention to. The next indicator we'll take a look at, again, it's another one that's been around for some time, and it's the simple moving average. So let's um, just put one on the chart. Let's say a 20-day moving average, then explain what it is. So here's a 20-day moving average on the chart of euro against the US dollar. Um, so what does it show? As it's a 20-day moving average, if we look at the, the latest price here at the moment, the 20-day moving average on euro US dollar at the time of recording is around 108. So all it does, it's a very simple mathematical um, indicator. It looks at the last 20 days closing prices. I've set it to closing prices. Um, adds them all up, divides them by 20 to come up with an average price for the last 20 days, plots it on a chart. And then the next day, tomorrow, it will look at the closing price of tomorrow and then look at the previous 19 days. So it's got, again, a 20-day average, plots it on the chart. So when prices are rising, the moving average will be rising as well because, of course, it's taking into account uh, higher prices. When prices are falling, because it's looking at an average, the moving average will be falling as well because it's taking into account falling prices. So how people use moving averages to generate buy and sell signals. It's, it's very straightforward. It's a crossover. So if we're using just one moving average on its own, like here, 
when the price moves above the moving average, so in this example, I'm looking at Friday the 4th of November, 2022, the price moves above the moving average, generates a buy signal. So whether you wait for the close on that particular day, if you're looking on a daily chart, or you jump on as soon as it crosses above the moving average, it's completely up to you. Uh, I think traditionally, uh, probably the textbook approach would be to wait for the close. But anyway, so it puts us in a position long, uh, moving averages are traditionally good in trending markets. So it rides the trend all the way up. And then the sell signal here on the red candle here, the 3rd of January, 2023, that's closing out that buy trade from back here in November and then selling short. Okay, so flipping the position. So with moving averages, they're always in the market. They're always long or short. Uh, so it went short there. Only stayed short for a couple of days if we're waiting for the close. Then on the 6th of January, the uh, euro US dollar price closes above the 20 day moving average in this example. So would have closed out the short and then flipped to long. So it would have bought, thinks the market's going up. The market does rally uh, for about a month, sells off. And at the time of recording, the current position is uh, the moving average. If we were trading using this approach, I'd be short. Be short euro, US dollar from the close of that candle, which was around 107.90 on the 3rd of February. Okay, so it works okay in big trends. Where it will get tripped up, here's the, the perfect example, actually, from December 2021 through to about February of 2022, when the market's going sideways because the price and the moving average is so close together, you can see you're just flipping around, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. So very messy when markets are not trending. Now I've got a 20 day moving average on here. If I change this to a 50 day, let's do that. Let's see what that looks like. So with a 50 day, you can see that actually the moving average would have avoided a lot of that chop that we just looked at and keeps us in the bigger trend for longer. So if we look at the buy signal down here in November, it would have bought, the 20 day moving average got stopped out in here, but this one stayed long until just recently. So the benefits of longer period moving averages, they catch perhaps the bigger swings in the market, they're further away from the price, um, but they'll typically get later into a trend and of course be later to come out of it and flip the position. So I think with moving averages, with a trend following approach like this, there's no perfect answer. You know, if you have a shorter term moving average, five day, a 10 day, a 20 day, you'll be in to trends much quicker, but you'll be much more vulnerable to sideways moving markets giving lots of false signals. Uh, if you have a longer term moving average like this, for example, a 50 day moving average, um, you'll stay out a lot of the noise in the market, so you won't be chopped around by false signals, but it'll be later into trends and later to get out of them. But, you know, moving averages, again, have been around for an awful long time. You know, back when charts were being plotted by hand, people would use moving averages. You know, popular still in the stock markets. Um, you know, I'm using it here on a daily chart. Again, if we flip this, if we stick with euro, US dollar, flip it over to an hourly chart, there we go. So we've got a 50 period moving average on here. There it is on an hourly, got a bit choppy here, but ultimately it would have gone short here uh, in February of 2023, the 2nd of February, would have closed out, but then reversed again the next hour, got a bit messy here. And the latest signal it gave was a buy signal down here towards the end of February on the hourly charts. Um, if I look at a moving average, which is very rare, I'll tend to do it just on the daily chart. I don't really wanna be looking at moving averages from a short term point of view. There's enough for me, enough noise going on for short term charts to worry about it. But if you want to have a look at a classic trend following stop and reverse your position system, then moving averages is, uh, is, is the one that's been around the longest. The next one we're going to look at, perhaps a combination of, of the old and the new a little bit, well, a bit newer than moving averages anyway. Let's take a look at Bollinger Bands. So here we have our uh, Bollinger Bands. Um, so what are Bollinger Bands? Well, it's it's an envelope. You can see here the various, the two lines at the extremes. 
plotted at a standard deviation level above and below a simple moving average of the price. This is a 20 day moving average. We just looked at that. So they're typically, these lines are plotted two standard deviations away from that simple moving average. And it's designed, it was de designed by a chap called John Bollinger and designed to give investors, hopefully, a higher probability of trying to identify when a market has reached an extreme or whether a market was potentially about to have something of a volatile breakout. Because we're looking, these, these, this envelope is two standard deviations away from this 20-day moving average. 90% um, of the price action should occur between the bands. So when we get the price, like for example here, this is um, Euro US dollar again for now. When we get the price here pushing out through the top of the Bollinger Band in this example, it can be uh, a suggestion of an extreme price move, that the price has gone too far and needs to pull back into the envelope. And of course, we had a similar one down here. Late September, uh, the Bollinger Band falls out. Uh, oh, sorry, the price falls out, the Bollinger Band's out of the envelope. So again, it's a suggestion that perhaps we need a bit of more of a return to normality. And we have very briefly, some examples up here as well uh, in early 2023, where euro dollar had run up about 400, 350 points in the course of a week and it's pushed through top of the Bollinger Band. And again, a suggestion that, OK, perhaps this has been a bit overcooked and the market needs to needs to calm down a little. I flipped this over to a daily chart of the S&P, just just again to so you can see and get a feel for um, how the Bollinger Bands work on a different market. So if we go back to June of 2022, we can see the market sells off quite heavily, starts probing the, the extreme of the band, that, the band, that two standard deviation. So again, a suggestion that perhaps the market needs to pull back in uh, more into, into the envelope of the bands. The other thing to look for with Bollinger Bands that those using Bollinger Bands will keep an eye on is if the Bollinger Bands start to narrow from where they've been historically. So it's because of a quiet period in the market. So again, some traders, if you look at this sort of period here, it was the, the first or it's the middle two weeks of December where we saw volatility drop off in this market, the S&P. It can be a suggestion that perhaps there's a, there's a bigger move coming. OK, so when we see Bollinger Bands push close together, uh, it can suggest there's a bigger move around the corner. Let's take a look at a different market. So here's an example on silver. It's an extreme example. And I think silver, in my experience, can be something of an extreme market at the best of times. But we can see here how the bands have come together uh, for pretty much all of January 2023. So we've got much tighter Bollinger Bands than we've seen on silver. So again, a suggestion uh, a warning that there could be a volatile move just around the corner. And that is eventually what we had with the market stuck in a fairly tight range, then started breaking down and moved uh, a couple of dollars, about 10% we saw over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, so some extreme moves now and again in silver where you see the top of the bands challenged only for the market to drop back uh, into the range again. But this narrowing, this is why I picked silver for this example, this narrowing of the bands uh, can be a suggestion that there is going to be an explosive move in the market. So where does that leave us? We've looked at lots of different um, approaches uh, during the course of this video. And like I say, I think technical analysis, clearly a very useful skill to have. It's how I started off in financial markets. Um, but I don't think the secret to trading is within technical analysis. There are other things that we need to think about. Uh, managing risk, running positions. Uh, the, the big thing that trips many people up, their losses end up being bigger than their winners. You know, you need to address that. Technical analysis is definitely a very good foundation. But I'd also say don't get too dragged down um, the rabbit hole of trying to find a perfect system because there are so many different indicators. And I've only touched on three here today. There are probably hundreds of different indicators 
for you to carry on trying out and back testing and trading them for a few months. Um, the secret to the markets isn't really, well, it isn't at all uh, in indicators. It's finding an approach that suits your own trading personality. I think, like I've said, if you see me on some of the live streams that I do on the channel, you know, I'm, I, for me, the, the first consideration is trend. I want to be trading with the momentum of the market. If a market's been going up for the last three months, I'm not going to sell just because a Bollinger Band says I should sell. The, my first consideration is to go with the overall trend of the market. So I would say, you know, don't get too bogged down in trying to find the perfect uh, indicator or the perfect pattern. Trading is not about perfection. Trading is about profitability. If only half of your trades are profitable, but when you lose, you lose $100. And when you're correct and make money, you make $200. You have a profitable trading strategy. Uh, you know, don't shoot yourself in the foot by looking for the perfect trading strategy because it's not out there. So that's it for this introduction to charting and technical analysis. I hope you found it useful. Don't forget um, to sign up for the newsletter. Go to the website, jonesthemarkets.com. There's a box at the bottom uh, of the page. You can sign up and get that every week. You can see my trading course on there and the results uh, for any questions on that. Feel free to drop me a line. And of course, if you like the video, if you could click on like and if you subscribe to the channel to stay notified of the various uh, market commentaries and live streams that I run throughout the week. Um, that's it from me. Good luck with your trading.